Hey guys. So the boy mouse has started hatching a plan, I think, because he's saying to his grandmother he's going to try and get a bottle of the delayed action mouse maker. So let's see what happens next. Could you carry it? I think so, I said. It's a very small bottle. I'm frightened of that stuff, my grandmother said. What would you do with it if you did manage to get it? One bottle is enough for 500 people, I said. That would give each and every witch down there a double dose at least. We could turn them all into mice. My grandmother jumped about an inch in the air. We were out on my balcony and there was a drop of about a million feet below us and I was very nearly bounced out of her hands over the railings when she jumped. Be careful with me, Grandmama, I cried. What an idea, she cried. It's fantastic. It's tremendous. You're a genius, my darling. Wouldn't it be something, I said. Wouldn't that really be something? We get rid of every witch in England in one swoop. And the Grand Eye Witch into the bargain, she cried. We've got to try it, I said. Listen, she said, nearly dropping me over the balcony once again in her excitement. If we brought this off, it would be the greatest triumph in the whole history of Wichuli. There's a lot of work to do, I said. Of course there's a lot of work to do, she said. Just for a start, supposing you did manage to get hold of one of those bottles, how would you get it into their food? We'll work that out later, I said. Let's try to get the stuff first. How can we find out for sure if that's her room just below us? We shall check it out immediately, my grandmother cried. Come along, there's not a second to waste. Carrying me in one hand, she went bustling out of the bedroom and along the corridor, banging her stick on the carpet with each step she took. We went down the stairs, one flight to the fourth floor. The bedrooms on either side of the corridor had their numbers painted on the doors in gold. Here it is, my grandmother cried. Number 454. She tried the door. It was locked, of course. She looked up and down the long, empty hotel corridor. I do believe you're right, she said. This room is almost certainly directly below yours. She marched back, marched back along the corridor, counting the number of doors from the Grand High Witch's room to the staircase. There were six. She climbed back up the, to the fl fifth floor and repeated the exercise. She is directly below you, my grandmother cried out. Her room is right below yours. She carried me back into my own bedroom and went out once again onto the balcony. That's her balcony down there, she said. And what's more, the door from her balcony is into her bedroom is wide open. How are you going to climb down? I don't know, I said. Our rooms were in the front of the hotel and they looked down onto the beach and the sea. Immediately below my balcony, thousands of feet below, I could see a fence of spiked railings. If I fell, I'd be a goner. I've got it, my grandmother cried. With me in her hand, she rushed back into her own room and began rummaging in the chest of drawers. She came out with a ball of blue knitting wool. One end of it was attached to some needles and a half-finished sock she'd been knitting for me. This is perfect, she said. I shall put you in the sock and lower you down onto the Grand Toe Witch's balcony. But we must hurry. Any moment now that monster will be returning to her room. The Mouse Burglar My grandmother hustled me back into my own bedroom and out onto the balcony. Are you ready? she asked. I'm going to put you in the sock now. I hope I can manage this, I said. I'm only a little mouse. You'll manage, she said. Good luck, my darling. She popped me into the sock and started lowering me over the balcony. I crouched inside the sock and held my breath. Through the stitches I could see it out quite clearly. Miles below me, the children playing on the beach were the size of beetles. The sock started swinging in the breeze. I looked up and saw my grandmother's head sticking out over the railings of the balcony above. You're nearly there, she called out. Here we go. Gently does it. You're down. I felt a slight bump. In you go, my grandmother was shouting. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Search the room. I jumped out of the sock and ran into the Grand High Witch's bedroom. There was the same musty smell about the place that I had noticed in the ballroom. It was the stench of witches. It reminded me of the smell inside the men's public lavatory at our local railway station. As far as I could see, the room was tidy enough. There was no sign anywhere that it was inhabited by anyone but an ordinary person. But then there wouldn't be, would there? No witch would be stupid enough to leave anything suspicious lying around for the hotel maid to see. Suddenly I saw a frog jumping across the carpet and disappearing under the bed. I jumped myself. Hurry up, came my grandmother's voice from somewhere high up outside. Grab the stuff and get out. I started skittering around and trying to search the room. 
This wasn't so easy. I couldn't, for example, open any of the drawers. I couldn't open the doors of the big wardrobe either. I stopped skittering about. I sat in the middle of the floor and had a think. If the Grand Tie Witch wanted to hide something top secret, where would she put it? Certainly not in any ordinary drawer. Not in the wardrobe either. It was too obvious. I jumped up onto the bed to get a better view of the room. Hey, I thought, what about under the mattress? Very carefully, I lowered myself over the edge of the bed and wormed my way underneath the mattress. I had, no, I had to push forward hard to make any headway, but I kept at it. I couldn't see a thing. I was scrabbling about under the mattress when my head suddenly bumped against something hard inside the mattress above me. I reached up and felt it with my paw. Could it be a little bottle? It was a little bottle. I could trace the shape of it through the cloth of the mattress, and right alongside it I felt another hard lump, and another, and another. The Grand Tie Witch must have slit open the mattress and put all the bottles inside, and then sewn it all up again. I began tearing away frantically at the mattress um, cloth above my head with my teeth. My front teeth were extremely sharp, and it didn't take long for me to make a small hole. I climbed into the hole and grabbed a bottle by the neck. I pushed it down through the hole in the mattress and climbed out after it. Walking backwards and dragging the bottle behind me, I managed to reach the end of the mattress. I rolled the bottle off the bed onto the carpet. It bounced, but it didn't break. I jumped down off the bed. I examined the little bottle. It was identical to the one the Grand High Witch had had in the ballroom. There was a label on this one. Formula 86, it said. Delayed Action Mouse Maker. Then it said, This bottle contains 500 doses. Eureka! I felt tremendously pleased with myself. Three frogs came hopping out from under the bed. They crouched on the carpet, staring at me with large black eyes. I stared back at them. Those huge eyes were the saddest things I had ever seen. It suddenly occurred to me that almost certainly once upon a time they had been children, those frogs, before the Grand High Witch had got hold of them. I stood there clutching the bottle and staring at the frogs. Who are you? I asked them. At that exact moment I heard a key turning in the lock of the door and the door burst open and the Grand High Witch swept into the room. The frogs jumped underneath the bed again in one quick hop. I darted after them still clutching the bottle, and I ran back against the wall and squeezed in behind one of the bedposts. The three frogs were clustered together under the middle of the bed. Frogs cannot hide like mice. They cannot run like mice, either. All they can do, poor things, is to hop about rather clumsily. Suddenly, the Grand High Witch's face came into view, peering under the bed. I put my head back behind the bedpost. So there you are, my little froggies, I heard her saying. You can stay where you are until I go to bed tonight, then I shall throw you out of the window, and the seagulls can have you for supper. Suddenly, very loud and clear, there came the sound of my grandmother's voice through the open balcony door. Hurry up, my darling, it shouted. Do hurry up, you'd better come out quickly. Who is calling? snapped the Grand High Witch. I peeked around the bedpost again and saw her walking across the carpet to the balcony door. Who is this on my balcony? she muttered. Who is it? Who dares to trespass on my balcony? She went through the door onto the balcony itself. What is this knitting wool hanging down here? I heard her saying. Oh, hello, came my grandmother's voice. I just dropped my knitting over the balcony by mistake, but it's all right. I've got one hold of one end of it. I can pull it up by myself. Thank you all the same. I marvelled at the coolness of her voice. Who were you talking to just now? Snapped the Grand High Witch. Who were you telling to high up and come out quickly? I was talking to my little grandson, I heard my grandmother saying. He's been in the bathroom for hours and it's time to come out. He's sitting there reading books and he forgets completely where he is. Do you have any children, my dear? I do not, shouted the Grand High Witch and she came quickly back into the bedroom, slamming the balcony door behind her. I was cooked. My escape route was closed. I was shut up in the room with the Grand High Witch and three terrified frogs. I was just as terrified as the frogs. I was quite sure that if I was spotted, I would be caught and thrown out over the balcony for the seagulls. There came a knock on the bedroom door. What is it this time? 
shouted the Grand High Witch. It is we, ancient ones, said a meek voice from behind the door. It is six o'clock and we've come to collect the bottles that you promised us, oh your grandness. I saw her crossing the carpet towards the door. The door was opened and then I saw a whole lot of feet and shoes beginning to enter the room. They were coming in slowly and hesitantly, as though the owners of those shoes were frightened of entering. Come in, come in, snapped the Grand High Witch. Do not stand out there dithering in the corridor. I don't have all night. I saw my chance. I jumped out from behind the bedpost and ran like lightning towards the open door. I jumped over several pairs of shoes on the way, and in three seconds I was out in the corridor, still clutching the precious bottle to my chest. No one had seen me. There were no shouts of, Mouse! Mouse! All I could hear were the voices of the ancient witches, burbling their silly sentences about how kind your grandness is, and all the rest of it. I went scampering down the corridor to the stairs and up one flight. I went to the fifth floor, and then along the corridor again until I came to the door of my own bedroom. Thank goodness there was no one in sight. Using the bottom, bottom of the little bottle, I began tap, tap, tapping on the door. Tap, 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 I went. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Would my grandmother hear me? I thought that she must. The bottle made quite a loud tap each time it struck. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Just so long as nobody came along the corridor. But the door didn't open. I decided to take a risk. Grandmama, I shouted as loudly as I possibly could. Grandmama, it's me. Let me in. I heard her feet coming across the carpet and the door opened. I went in like an arrow. I've done it, I cried, jumping up and down. I've got it, Grandmama. Look, here it is. I've got a whole bottle of it. She closed the door. She bent down and picked up me up and hugged me. Oh, my darling, she cried. Thank heavens you're safe. She took the little bottle from me and read the label aloud. Formula 986 Delayed Action Mouse Maker, she read. This bottle contains 500 doses. You brilliant darling boy, you're a wonder, you're a marvel. How on earth did you get out of her room? I nipped out when the ancient witches were coming in, I told her. It was all a bit hairy, Grandmama. I wouldn't want to do it again. I saw her too, my grandmother said. I know you did, Grandmama. I heard you talking to each other. Didn't you think she was absolutely foul? She's a murderer, my grandmother said. She's the most evil woman in the entire world. Did you see her mask? I asked. It's amazing, my grandmother said. It looks just like her real face. Even though I knew it was a mask, I still couldn't tell. Oh, my darling, she cried, giving me a hug. I thought I'd never see you again. I'm so happy you got away. Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins meet Bruno. I wonder how your mum or dad would feel if they found out you'd been turned into a mouse. My grandmother carried me back into her own bedroom and put me on the table. She set the precious bottle down beside me. What time are those witches having supper in the dining room? She asked. Eight o'clock, I said. She looked at her watch. It's now ten past six, she said. We've got until eight o'clock to work at our next move. Suddenly her eye fell upon Bruno. He was still at the banana bowl on the table. He'd eaten three bananas and was now attacking a fourth. He had become immensely fat. That's quite enough, my grandmother said, lifting him out of the bowl and putting him onto the tabletop. I think it's time we'd return this little fellow to the bosom of his family. Don't you agree, Bruno? Bruno scowled at her. I'd never seen a mouse scowl before, but he managed it. My parent, my parents let me eat as much as I want, he said. I'd rather be with them than you. Of course you would, my grandmother said. Do you know where your parents might be at this moment? They were in the lounge not long ago, I said. I saw them sitting there as we dashed through on our way up here. All right, my grandmother said. Let's go and see if they are still there. Do you want to come along? She added, looking at me. Yes, please, I said. I shall put you both in my handbag, she said. Keep quiet and stay out of sight. If you must be bad now and again, don't show more than your nose. Her handbag was a large, bulgy, black leather affair with a tortoiseshell clasp. She picked up Bruno and me and popped us into it. I shall leave the clasp undone, she said, but be sure to keep out of sight. I had no intention of keeping out of sight. I wanted to see everything. I seated myself in a little side pocket inside the bag, near the clasp, and from there I was able to poke my head out whenever I wanted to. Hey, Bruno called out. Give me the rest of that banana I was eating. 
Oh, all right, my grandmother said. Anything to keep you quiet? She dropped the half-eaten banana into the bag, then slung the bag over her arm and marched out of the room and went thumping along the corridor with her walking stick. We went down into the lift to the ground floor and made our way through the reading room to the lounge. And there, sure enough, sat Mr and Mrs Jenkins in a couple of armchairs with a low round glass covered table between them. There were several other groups in there as well, but the Jenkinsons were the only couple sitting alone. Mr Jenkins was reading a newspaper. Mrs Jenkins was knitting something large and mustard coloured. Only my nose and eyes were above the clasp of my grandmother's handbag, but I had a super view. I could see everything. My grandmother, dressed in black lace, went thumping across the floor of the lounge and halted in front of the Jenkins' table. Are you Mr and Mrs Jenkins? she asked. Mrs Jenkins looked at her over the top of his Mr Jenkins looked at her over the top of his newspaper and frowned. Yes, he said. I am Mr Jenkins. What can I do for you, madam? I'm afraid I have some rather alarming news for you, she said. It's about your son, Bruno. What about Bruno? Mr Jenkins said. Mrs Jenkins looked up but went on knitting. What's the little blighter been up to now? Mr Jenkins asked. Raiding the kitchen, I suppose. It's a bit worse than that, my grandmother said. Do you think we might go somewhere more private while I tell you about it? Private, Mr Jenkins said. Why do we have to be private? This is not an easy thing for me to have to explain, my grandmother said. I'd much rather we all went up to your room and sat down before I tell you any more. Mr Jenkins lowered his paper. Mrs Jenkins stopped knitting. I don't want to go up to my room, madam, Mr Jenkins said. I'm quite comfortable here, thank you very much. He was a large, coarse man, and he wasn't used to being pushed around by anybody. Kindly state your business and then leave us alone, he added. He spoke as though he was addressing someone who was trying to sell him a vacuum cleaner at the back door. My poor grandmother, who had been doing her best to be as kind to them as possible, now began to bristle a bit herself. We really can't talk in here, she said. There are too many people. This is a rather delicate and personal matter. I'll talk where I dash well want to, madam, Mr Jenkins said. Come on now, out with it. If Bruno's broken a window or smashed his spectacles, I'll pay for the damage. But I'm not budging out of this seat. One or two other groups in the room were beginning to stare at us now. Where is Bruno? Anyway, Mr Jenkins, Mrs Jenkins said. Tell him to come here and see me. He's here already, my grandmother said. He's in my handbag. She patted the big floppy leather bag with her walking stick. What the heck do you mean he's in your handbag? Mr Jenkins shouted. Are you trying to be funny? Mrs Jenkins said, very prim. There's nothing funny about this, my grandmother said. Your son has suffered a rather unfortunate mishap. He's always suffering mishaps, Mr Jenkins said. He suffers from overeating, and then he suffers from wind. You should hear him after supper. He sounds like a brass band. But a good dose of castor all soon puts him right again. Where is the little beggar? I've already told you, my grandmother said. He's in my handbag, but I do think it might be better if we went somewhere private before you meet him in his present state. This woman's mad, Mrs Jenkins said. Tell her to go away. The plain fact is, my grandmother said, that your son Bruno has been rather drastically altered. Altered? shouted Mr Jenkins. What the devil do you mean, altered? Go away, Mrs Jenkins said. You're a silly old woman. I'm trying to tell you as gently as I possibly can that Bruno really is in my handbag, my grandmother said. My own grandson actually saw them doing it to him. Saw who doing what to him, for heaven's sake, shouted Mr Jenkins. He had a black moustache which jumped up and down when he shouted. Saw the witches turning him into a mouse, my grandmother said. Call the manager, dear, Mrs Jenkins said to her husband. Have this mad woman thrown out of the hotel. At this point, my grandmother's patience came to an end. She fished around in her handbag and found Bruno. She lifted him out and dumped him on the glass top table. Mrs Jenkins took one look at the fat little brown mouse, who was still chewing a bit of banana, and she let out a shriek that rattled the crystals on the chandelier. She sprang out of her chair, yelling, It's a mouse! Take it away! I can't stand the things! It's Bruno, my grandmother said. You nasty, cheeky old woman, shouted Mr Jenkins. 
He started flapping his newspaper at Bruno, trying to sweep him off the table. My grandmother rushed forward and managed to grab hold of him before he was swept away. Mrs Jenkins was still screaming her head off, and Mr Jenkins was towering over us and shouting, Get her out of here! How dare you threaten my wife like that! Take your filthy mouse away this instant! Help! screamed Mrs Jenkins. Her face had gone the colour of the underside of a fish. Well, I did my best, my grandmother said, and with that she turned and sailed out of the room, carrying Bruno with her. Mm. Wow, they didn't take that very well, did they? The next chapter is called The Plan. I wonder if you can, guys can guess what their plan will be to get the witches to take Formula 86 Delayed Action Mouse Maker. Let's find out tomorrow. <laughs>